God is a common name. And just like countless other common names, Jack or Olivia, Raj or Fatima, there's almost nothing you can tell about the character of any specific God just from the use of that label. In Alice Through the Looking Glass, the famous book, in a rather unintelligible conversation with Alice about the meaning of the word glory, Humpty Dumpty says this, When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean neither more nor less. That's the problem with the term God. It can mean just what any person or religion chooses it to mean. And if we're honest, to some extent at least, exactly the same problem has developed within the church. We have the God who approves of war and the God who's fundamentally against it. The God who's for capital punishment and the one who's appalled by it. The God who still turns his face against women in church leadership positions and the God who positively encourages them into such roles. The God who once opposed divorce and remarriage in any circumstances and the God who is now far more accepting of both. The God who teaches, walk with me and I'll make you healthy and wealthy and the God of those who live in suffering and poverty. The God who gives us the technology for stem cell research and birth control. And the God who's outraged by our development of both. The God who welcomes LGBT people and celebrates their sexuality and gender. And the God who disapproves and wants them cured. But such views about who God is, what God's like and how God wants us to live, not only impact our personal lives and our churches, they've also had a huge impact on the way in which entire countries are run, sometimes with devastating results. Consider, for instance, the Dutch Reformed Church of South Africa and the way in which it was intimately bound up with what it believed to be the supremacy of the white Africana community. It even developed a whole theology to legitimize its support of the apartheid system, the institutionalized separation of the South African people according to their race. What's known as ham theology made it possible for Dutch reformed scholars to teach that the Afrikaners as a race, fulfilled a similar role to that of the people of Israel in Old Testament times. Dutch Reformed theologians viewed the curse that Noah placed on his grandson Canaan, the son of Ham, in Genesis chapter 9 verses 20 to 27 as the biblical justification for Israel's conquest and enslavement of the Canaanites. Afrikaners believed that black Africans, or Hamites, as they were sometimes called, were also descendants of Ham through Canaan. Their theology also claimed that the Bible accepts racial and ethnic differences and that this is clearly seen in the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11 and was even recognised by the Apostle Paul in his famous speech in Acts chapter 17 where he acknowledges that God has, as it says, determined the exact places where they should live. All this was then bundled up and used as a justification for segregation and for the decisions of white Afrikaners regarding the division of the land and their tightly controlled allocation of living areas for non-whites. This same theology was, in fact, widely held by many European and North American Christian groups throughout the 18th and 19th as well as the first half of the 20th century. And in spite of the progress that the civil rights movement made in the US throughout the 1950s and 60s, it was not until the early 1980s that the World Alliance of Reformed Churches declared that apartheid was a heresy and expelled the Dutch Reformed Church from its federation. But still, only in 1986 did the Dutch Reformed Church of South Africa finally express its repentance of the sin of supporting apartheid. But the way in which the Bible has historically been read by the powerful still has devastating implications for others. It would be ridiculous not to mention at this point, for instance, 
that 36 of the 53 nations which make up the Commonwealth, accounting for a third of the world's population, still live under the homophobic legacy of the British Empire and its theology. Is it any wonder that George Bernard Shaw once famously observed that God created man in his image? Unfortunately, man has returned the favour. It was Shaw's contemporary, the influential sociologist, M. L. Durkheim, who suggested that each tribe or society invents for itself a god, a kind of totem or mascot, who reflects its values, standards, aspirations, hopes, ambitions, attitudes, and then they worship the totem. They worship the mascot, thus legitimising and endorsing their own moral choices and behaviours. Archbishop William Temple once summed all this up when he explained, the more distorted a person's idea of God and the more passionately they're committed to it, the more damage they will do. So I end with three questions. First, do you agree or do you see things differently? But then if you do agree, what can we do in our generation to undo the negative legacy of these sins of the past? And lastly, how do we ensure that we don't make the same kind of theological and pastoral mistakes ever again?